In this lesson, we are going to begin our three-part discussion on one of the most important aspects of property law or land law, which are leases. Now, we are going to discuss the formalities, the creation and termination, as well as the enforceability of leases in relation to UK property law. The very first aspect that we need to understand is that the very notion or the concept of leases allows for two or more persons to enjoy benefits of an estate in land at the same time. Now, if you note back to the introduction lesson of this course, we discussed on the difference between an estate and an interest, both being proprietary rights in land and interest is that which is a right over another's land, whereas an estate is ownership of your own land. So either be it a freehold or a leasehold, in this case, of course, a lease, the ownership is the most paramount or the most important, uh, the most enforceable type of proprietary right. Now, there are several characteristics of a lease, and these have been outlined in the seminal case of Street and Mountford, and we'll have a look at that right now. The very first feature or characteristic of a lease or to determine if it is in fact a lease is to identify whether there is exclusive possession. Now, exclusive possession is where the tenant has control over who enters the land itself, who enters the property. He has the ability, in fact, to exclude anyone, including the freehold owner or the landlord himself. Now, there are several considerations here to be taken into account. Firstly, if for some instance the landlord or the freehold owner retains a key, that may negate exclusive possession, as was held in Aslan and Murphy. However, much like many other aspects of law, there is in fact an exception to this rule, which is that if the key was retained, to, for example, do repairs or for any emergency purposes, then it may not negate exclusive possession. Now, what should be derived from this is that in relation to exclusive possession, at least, it's determined by court on a case-by-case -case basis. There might be extenuating circumstances which lead the court to believe that whatever the retention of the key or entry permission that was retained uh, by the landlord or the freehold owner was due to some particular reasoning and it's not a complete blanket situation where a key is retained that there is no exclusive possession with the leasehold owner. Now this brings us to another important point in relation to exclusive possession insofar as to discuss the difference between uh, the license and a lease as well. Now we'll look at this a bit later on in this particular topic but the crux of it, the main elements, are the fact that the main difference between a lease and a license is in this component of exclusive possession. So the important aspect to determine, as per Street and Mountford as well, uh, as per the dicta of Lord Templeman, is that in order to establish a lease, one of the pivotal, most important, and the first aspect that you must identify is that whether the purported leasehold owner has exclusive possession of the land. Now, the second characteristic in relation to that which has been outlined by Street and Mountford is whether there are certainty of terms. What this means, in a very simplistic nutshell, is whether there is a maximum duration of the lease stipulated. And where this is stipulated, then there might be a lease in place. The third characteristic that has been outlined in Street and Mountford is the obligation to pay rent. Now, the dicta in Street has defined this as a hallmark of a tenancy, as a cornerstone in fact. Because after all, there must be some sort of consideration that has passed. This is in fact a contract for the most part. But having said that, the consideration or the obligation, the, the rent component itself, need not be monetary. Conversely, however, the Law of Property Act of 1925 does not specify the need for rent. Ashburn and Arnold also stipulate that there is no need of a rent for tenancy. 
whereas Dresden and Collingson speaks of a variable rent which equals to a license. Now, in relation to certainty of terms, we were very specific on the terms having been need to be mentioned. Similarly, Section 205 of the Law of Property Act does not specify rent, and yet Street and Mountford has considered that pay, payment of rent or the consideration is a cornerstone of or the hallmark of a tenancy. All three cases, as in Street and Mountford, Ashburn and Arnold, as well as Dresden and Collinson, are available in detail in your case summaries, and I urge you to have a look at it to understand why exactly the dictas in these three cases differ from each other, and whether this component, this characteristic of obligation to pay rent, is as important as outlined in Street in relation to determine whether a lease is in place. Now, as considered a bit earlier, there are several differences between a lease and a license, so let's look at that right now. Firstly, a lease can be defined with four primary characteristics. There is exclusive possession, there is certainty of terms, there is consideration in place, and it's in fact a proprietary estate. Conversely, if you consider a license, there is permission which is given, it is a personal right, there is consideration which passes, and it is not a proprietary estate. Now note that there are several distinct similarities as well. Conversely, think of the earlier discussion we had on the need for rent as considered in street as being required, and Ashburn as being considered it is not required. The crux of it, however, is that there are more rights which vest with the leasehold owner as opposed to the licensee in the context of a license being in place as opposed to a lease. Now, in order to determine whether there was an intention or an existence of a lease, there are several views that we need to consider. Firstly, have a look at Hazelhurst. The first view was that the party's intention was construed through the words of the contract, irrespective of the facts of the matter. So it was very literal, and the contract was binding, and it was the end-all component of whether a lease was established or not. Whatever the surrounding facts or the party's intention was, in fact, irrelevant. Fast forward to the second view, which is expounded in Street, where the terms itself are irrelevant, and what was looked at are the facts of the matter, a complete 360 on that which was held in Hazelhurst. Currently, however, while street is upheld, in order to prevent sham contracts, Bruton and London Quadrant Trust has stipulated that the landlord trying to escape the rent act must be avoided. Have a look at Bruton in order to get a better exposition of the current view in terms of UK property law. Street still stands as good law. It's just that now it has been qualified somewhat by the inclusion of the test within London Quadrant Trust. So have a look at both cases, including Hazelhurst, all available in your case summaries. There are several types of leases which are recognized by the Land Registration Act of 2002, a seminal act which changed the landscape, so to speak, of uh, UK property law. There are registrable leases, which are those that are greater than seven years, as well as leases that override the register, which are less than seven years. Now, this component of that which being seven years or greater than seven years must be registered. Even if the freehold estate is not, the lease itself must be registered, and that's, that's good law to this day. Otherwise, it cannot take any legal effect and it will only exist in equity. Registration has become mandatory following the Land Registration Act of 2002. There are several formalities as need to be discussed as a conclusion of this particular section of the three-part section in relation to leases. So the formalities are firstly, uh, in order to enter into a leasehold contract, you must be legally competent, which means 18 and above, as well as not insane, which is sound of mind. The individual must be sound of mind. It must be uh, by deed, 
as per Section 52.1 of the Law of Property Act of 1925, as well as signed and witnessed by a person capable of it, which means someone competent of it, as per Section 1 of the Law of Property Miscellaneous Provisions Act of 1989. Now note that for a lease less than three years, this does not require writing. That was an introduction into the formalities associated with leaseholds or leases in relation to property law. In the next lesson, we will move on to the secondary component of this discussion on leases, which is the creation and termination of a lease. Thank you for watching this video. If you want to learn more and check out some of my other videos, click on the links on screen now. If you want access to the full courses, which includes spider graphs and case summaries, check out the description below. See you in the next lesson.